Our lives are like ripples in time. Each unique. Each precious and rare. Each comprised of the events, experiences, and people that touch us. We sit poised at the center of our own existence. And while many events are beyond our control, more often than not, we choose our path. Every decision, good or bad, determines our outcome and sets in motion the course of our life. This group of young people are taking part in an intensive day-long education and awareness program called CHAT. Participants get a sobering and often dramatic glimpse into the tragic consequences of decisions made under the influence of drugs or alcohol. The students in this car are experiencing firsthand the extrication techniques firefighters use to remove victims from a car wreck. These delegates emerge unscathed. Unfortunately, for many victims of impaired driving incidents in Canada, the outcome is far more tragic. In 1999, a poor decision made by one person had repercussions that not only destroyed a family, but impacted an entire community. Aaron was the uh you like to call him the technical one of the family. He was the one who fixed the VCR. He was the one who taught me how to work the computer. His little brother was more of the uh, happy-go-lucky kid. He could make a toy out of anything. He was the one that uh, just lived life to his fullest. Um, the only way I can really describe it is that part of me died the same night as Aaron and Devon died. It's part that will never come back to life for me. The drive there was my normal drive. I've done a hundred times to the arena. Devin in the back, Aaron in the front, and his Aaron's favorite song had just come on the stereo and he leaned over and turned the volume up a bit and started moving around to the music and I remember the last thing I said to him was, you keep doing that with your neck and one day you're going to hurt yourself. And the next thing I remember is seeing headlights and thinking, are they in my lane? Are they not in my lane? And at night it's so dark that sometimes you can't tell when they're in the distance. And then the only word that came out of my mouth was, what? I remember calling them by name, trying to get a response. I could see Aaron, but I could not see Devon. And my calls just echoed through the car. There was no sound. There was there was nothing. It was a uh, light-up night in Caledonia, which is normally, you know, joyous, fun night for the family. We got the call for the accident on 6th Highway. Uh, we responded. Fire department and paramedics were already there. I saw the other vehicle involved, upside down, facing a northeast direction. He was uh, conscious and being uh, extricated. Um, I don't know how long went, went by before I realized that there was a second vehicle involved. Of course, that, that's when things, you know, we realized how bad things were. I could not get myself 
out of the car and I just wanted somebody to be with my kids. So I, I he insisted that I call my husband because I wanted somebody there to be with my boys because I knew it wasn't good. I remember coming to the scene and just throwing my door open and uh, trying to assess what was going on and I could see uh, wreckage everywhere. I, I could see a car to the right. Uh, I couldn't identify it if it was mine or not. Um, when I finally figured out that I, I didn't think it was, I, I started running up the road because I could see more rescue crews up the road and I was jumping over um, uh, wreckage, uh, gas tanks, tires, uh, everything. And I got to the car and the police stopped me at that point and I could tell that this was my car, uh, barely, I could hardly tell that it was a car anymore. And when the emergency crews arrived, they, they wanted me to try and get out of the car, and I couldn't. I was, I was trapped. There was no way I could get out on my own. So they decided that they would remove Aaron and Devin first. And I can remember holding on to Aaron's leg and just thinking, geez, I hope his leg's not broken. How can he play hockey if he has a broken leg? I just, I got to the car and I could see how hurt Aaron and Devin were and I knew it was bad and uh, there was, there was blood everywhere. And his foot was jammed somewhere in the uh, dash of the car so the rescue workers wanted me to pull it out. And I can just remember being so afraid that I was going to hurt him. And then I could see them uh, getting Aaron out first. Um, they, they, they took him out. I, I saw his leg go limp and fall on the stretcher and uh, blood coming from his head. And uh, I was just yelling to him, <clears throat> you're going to be okay, bud. And I knew, but I knew it was bad. So I, I got back in my car, I raced down the back roads to get to the hospital. So when I got there, uh, there was a doctor waiting at the door. He asked me to identify my sons and I told them what they looked like. And he says they've, uh, they've both passed away. Basically what it came down to was a, a person that had been drinking some some alcoholic beverages and decided to make a trip into Hamilton and was northbound um, on this highway, 6th highway, and he went across into the oncoming lane. Uh, his blood alcohol readings were consistent with impairment, uh, without a doubt, and he was charged accordingly. I coached Aaron. Uh, I coached him in baseball, primarily in baseball. He had a natural talent for what he did. Uh, he was a very good pitcher, and um, he always gave 110% when he was out on the ice or the ball field. Never let his team down type of thing. And, uh, and yeah, he was sorely missed. And, and the fact that it was actually a drunk driver that had you know, taken such a toll on so many people. Um, the ripple effect that this has had has been huge. And it all comes down to one decision. Oh, I think I'll drive. Oh, I, you know, oh, maybe I better not. Well, I think I'm okay. A terrible decision. I mean, all it would have taken was you know, what, put a quarter in a telephone and call a taxi, and well, those boys would be still running around. Your perception of risk is minimized because you're, you're, you've been drinking, and people don't realize how little it takes to, to make you impaired. Um, and, and the law is quite clear. Uh, case law says that a, a slight slight impairment. It doesn't have to be drunk. It's not drunk driving, it's impaired driving. When, when, when two loving, beautiful little boys like this are taken, it has such an impact on everybody. You, you really start to realize what's happened. You really start to understand what you've lost.
This is your pelvis, this is your spine, your back, and this is your pubic bone, these are your hips, and as you can see, it's completely disintegrated. Diagnostic Imaging Manager Steve Egan is a direct witness to the consequences of poor decision making. Fight with the girlfriend, speed off on your motorcycle, you wipe out, you so, and this is a big kid, big femur, he's got a leg like a baseball bat, you can imagine how much pressure it took, that's right above your knee right here. So you can imagine how much work it was to uh, line his leg up, cut a hole in your hip, drill a hole right into your knee, and pound this huge pipe in, and then we drill holes right in through your skin to keep it in place for probably two years. This girl was 15 and she dove into a, a very uh, shallow swimming pool. She's paralyzed, she was 15. I don't remember any of the party, but apparently it was all night. I was drinking at the party. I was under the influence of alcohol and my judgment was obviously impaired. The story was told that I was on the roof and apparently I started laying down at first holding onto the windows. And then the friend who was riding in the passenger seat couldn't see my hand no more. And he said, where's Chris's hands? Stuck his head out the window and noticed that I was now surfing on the top of the roof. He heard something and he said he's seen me out the rear view. I hit the ground. When we got there, they said, um, well, we've got him sedated uh, and we've done some x-rays. Looks like he's hit his head pretty good. They said he's got a blood clot. We got to take a bone flap out and uh, relieve the uh, pressure in his brain. So then they called, called us back in and said, look, you know, uh, the bleeding's not stopping. He says, we got to go back in and uh, we have to do another operation. Now they said the odds are even worse they say, you know, I don't think he's going to make this one. The second one was, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then, uh, he was going through a second operation. And the only thing that we knew was, you know, he may not get out of this. It's, like I'm gonna lose my older brother. We joked around, we fought, we were brother and sister, and it was, you know, good. And then the thought of not having an older brother was just horrifying, I guess. A hallway full of friends and everybody waiting in the emergency rooms at hospitals for me, and just from the cards I got and I've read, I put a lot of stress on my family, a lot of my friends, and. It's something they shouldn't have to go through. Something stupid I did not only affected me, but it basically caused a whole lot of trouble for everybody I love or know. It, it almost tore us apart. And, uh, sorry. Basically, I was an 18-year-old baby. I had to relearn everything over again. Um, it's, it's just really hard to cope with. Like, it's like I lost a brother because even till today, he's not the same person he was. When I, I got to go out a couple times with my friends and we went to a bar and we watched a band play, I started crying that night because I realized I cannot play the guitar anymore. It's not gonna happen. Chris was so popular in school that you know, he wasn't known personally, he, he was still known. You know what I mean? Like, he, he, everybody knew him. Playing football and rugby seven days a week for school teams and both varsity teams on First City. The accident just changed all that. I had been accepted into all the colleges I had applied to, but I did not get to finish my OEC year. That minute of fun that I had cost me three years of my life. Today, Chris shares his story with other young people. He speaks at high schools in an effort to build awareness about the consequences of decision-making under the influence. After I was better when I first speaking to high schools about what I did, the first high school I spoke to was my old high school. 
and I didn't realize it until when I was up there speaking, noticing how many people left crying because they knew me, they knew who I was, or they knew my sister who was younger than me and was in their grade and what she went through. The fact that everybody, you know, knew of my brother or knew my brother personally was just so hard because, you know, people just don't stop asking questions. Like all my speaking within chat programs and all that is to share my story to help people from doing the same thing I did. It just gives them that second chance to think about it. And if I can help one person from hurting themselves, dying, or just anything of the sort, I feel what I'm talking about is good and worth it. The first thing that they're going to do, whether you're a passenger, whether you're a driver. Bad decisions made under the influence of drugs and alcohol can be the catalyst of life and death struggles that play out here. To deliver their message with impact, organizers have arranged a surprise for today's group. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's move it! Do critical, get a land transport, the helicopter, quicker go land transport, let's just get a helicopter. When you're going through your youth, your teenage years, it's really a discovery period. You're trying to figure out who you are. And whenever you're trying to figure out who you are, you have to test the limits of what you can do, as well as making decisions, some of them good, some of them bad. All of them have a certain risk associated with them. And that's the key, is trying to figure out what's a good risk a bad risk. Yep, please. Put it in your chest immediately. Any family? We are mortal. Things do happen. The law of gravity does work. We do fall down and we do break. And if we make bad decisions, we're more likely to break. Often we take risks and nothing happens. And we remember friends who did something and nothing happens. We might even drink a little bit and the majority of people get home. But unfortunately, it does happen. What we usually see in the emergency and what really strikes us is the 5% that don't make it. Here you go. Okay. French, you won't get out there. Check. Alcohol has been around for thousands of years, so we have quite a history with it, but man is, is evolving in his uh, technological know-how and has found lots of other ways to impair our, our senses. And we discover weeds and we discover chemicals, and we discover things that go out on a prescription pad as well. Lots of different ways of becoming intoxicated and lots of different things that can happen as a result. It's not just you who's gonna be affected, it's gonna be the people who are around you who don't know you. It's gonna be your friends, the people you love. Um, just keeps on going. You will be autopsied. Once they've examined the brain in the skull, they do remove it and they... Jill Faladay is a funeral director with hands-on experience. Once they're finished with you, because you are just a dead... She can tell you that the majority of sudden deaths for teens and young adults are connected in some way to impairment. Most. Most um, incidences where death has occurred is from under the influence, be it drugs or alcohol. There are those that die um, tragically through maybe driving their vehicle too fast, maybe not wearing a helmet when they're driving the, the quad or something, but for the majority, the high percentage wise, it's under the influence, for sure. And an autopsy is where the pathologist does a Y cut throughout your body. They start at your shoulders, they cut across, they go under your breast and down to the pubic. Yeah, it disturbs me. It, it, sometimes it angers me because uh, because I'm, I'm here with the family and I'm seeing the pain and the horror and the trauma that they're going through for the rest of their life. So sometimes I get a little actually angry that, that the person didn't think about it before they got behind a wheel of some kind of a vehicle. Just take a night off from the drinking and the drugs. Just take that night off and then make a deal with your friends the next night. You know what, I'm not driving. Someone else is gonna have to drive and be the sensible one. How you doing, everybody? My name's Ron, and... Um... Ron Raddy is a regular speaker. Ron talks openly about his life as a quadriplegic and the fateful decision that changed his life forever. Um, I was out um, 
one Saturday night, you know, having a good time, drinking some beers. Having fun with a group of people and, uh, you know, we were drinking and driving and then I noticed my cousin, he, he was still going strong and, and I was thinking, geez, I don't want him to drive me home because we just not, might not make it home. So me being the good Samaritan, I thought, okay, let me drive and, and uh, you know, I'll get us home. Okay. You know, I, 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 I was the average person, you know, I played sports, hockey, baseball. I thought, you know, I'm 21, what the hell's going to happen to me? And I got 20 minutes from home and here I am. I uh, lost control of the truck that uh, we were in on Highway 24 coming out of Cambridge. And, um, you know, I underwent hours of surgery and um, Neurologist came in and he said, uh, Ron, this is the way it's going to be for the rest of your life. And from that moment on, it was like, I, you know, I think my heart was up in my throat and I just wasn't prepared for what was in store for the rest of my life. To make his point, Ron speaks frankly about his life and the hardships that he faces each day as the result of a bad decision made under the influence. You look at an infant and stuff, you know, you watch them grow up and, you know, you have to teach them to go to the washroom, you have to teach them, you know, to be able to eat themselves. And so for me, I went through the same sort of process, except that as a 21 year old male. So many people come in and do your personal care. And, and when I mean personal, you can't get any more personal. You got, you know, people helping you with bowel routines. You've got people helping you um, with your bladder. You've got you know, people your own age washing you, dressing you, that bothers me. Ron hopes that young people will hear his story and think twice about the consequences of decisions made under the influence of drugs and alcohol. I went out and did something without thinking it through and this is how I ended up. Um, I hurt my parents, um, my brothers and sisters, my common-law wife at the time. Um, especially my daughter too. Something you might have done time and time again, but there's that one time that uh, you're not going to be so lucky. And that was me. You know, I, I did all these things without thinking of, about the consequences and uh, this one time it caught me and kicked me in the ass and I'm suffering for it. Making good decisions is difficult enough. Complicating the process by making decisions while you are impaired by drugs or alcohol increases the risk factor substantially. Of course, not all poor decisions lead to physical tragedy. Your emotional and mental well-being is also at risk when you engage in risky behavior due to impairment. That's excellent. I'm not kidding you. What is this? This is so weak. The night has just started. But you how do you expect me to get drunk yes. at all? Oh, Danielle. hey! Danielle. I thought you weren't coming tonight. Where's uh, Seth? Yeah, some soccer thing. I don't know. <laughs> he'd rather spend oh, time with right? soccer than he would with you. Shut up. Yeah, he'd rather Not... spend it with a bunch of guys than his own girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't say much about you, does it? Shut up. So do you want anything to drink or anything? No, no, no. I'm good. I'm good. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you can't handle that, how are you supposed to handle the rest of the night? <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm sorry. At least it's vodka, it so it's not gonna sting. <laughs> okay, one so shot's not a big deal, whatever. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's great. Just do it. Go! Bottoms up. Bottoms up. Put it down. Hurry up. Put it down. <laughs> oh. 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 Okay, that's it. No more shots for me. I quit this no, game. You only had one. You that's all. Guys, Seth would kick my ass if he knew I was drinking this much. Well, then he should be here. Yeah, guys. Oh! <laughs> not not take, as much this time, though. That she should take two. Okay. No! Take... Go! How is this good for me? Oh, you'll find out later. <laughs> <laughs> She's getting the hang of it. She's getting the hang of it. Are you okay? <laughs> yeah. I love you. I love you, too. Aww. <laughs> Whoa, buddy. We've drank in a lot of that. <coughs> Yeah, we have. <laughs> okay. Oh, it hurts. She didn't look so good. I didn't.
just need um, to. Oh. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you gotta lay down. Hey, I have a boyfriend. <laughs> So you're gonna quit the team? Yeah, well, I have no other choice. Seth's my best friend. I can't believe I did that to him. I can't even look in his face. I'm such an idiot. I just can't believe I did that. Oh my god. I still feel like shit. I haven't talked to him yet. I don't even know what I'm gonna say to him. I, I, I still wanna be with him. I don't know how many people know. I don't even want to go to school on Monday and find out. Yeah, I know. I'm so sorry I did this. I'll call you later. Okay, bye. Teenage years are fun. Go out there and enjoy and even take some risks but I always calculate how, how good those risks are. You cannot make a sound decision under the influence. I don't care who you are. It's far too easy to make a bad decision when you're, when you're under the influence. If you've been drinking, just, you know, stay overnight or, or uh, get a cab or call your dad. Try and have a head about yourself. Know your limits, know your boundaries. Try to have somebody keep an eye on you, I guess. Have a friend who's kind of watching out and you look out for them too. People have to make uh, uh, better decisions and, and just not take the risk. There was anywhere between maybe six and eight people that knew this person was impaired before they left. A simple phone call and Aaron and Devin would be here today. There's good decisions and bad decisions and just think about the consequences and think about what's the worst possible thing that can happen and am I ready for it. <laughs>